remains of the feast. It's from this book, The Art of Dying. It's her first collection of short stories. And she's also got a book called uh, The Thousand Faces of Night, which I very highly recommend. It's a beautiful book. It's you can it, you can be original without kind of breaking the mold. It's about a married woman in India, but it's it's written so honestly and without artifice and without uh, fanfare, without any showiness that it, she's. She became one of my favorite favorite writers, and I've read some of her other stuff. All of it is consistently good. Okay, uh, today we will. Let me just share the screen. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. Very good. All right. Um, so this is Remains of the Feast. It's one of the stories in that book. The Art of Dying, and uh, we'll go through that. I'll read through it, and then we can discuss it. If you're not speaking, can you please go and mute yourselves? That'd be great. Um, okay. Remains of the feast. The room still smells of her. Not as she did when she was dying. An overripe smell that clung to everything that had touched her. Sheets, saris, hands. She had been in the nursing home for only 10 days, but a bed so grew like an angry red welt on her back. Her neck was a big hump, and she lay in bed like a moody camel that would snap or bite at unpredictable intervals. The goitered lump, familiar swelling I had seen on her neck all my life was now a cancer that spread like a fire down the old body, licking clean everything in its way. The room now smells like a pressed faded rose, a dry, elusive smell, burnt, a candle put out. We were not exactly roommates, but we shared two rooms, one corner of the old ancestral home, all my 20-year-old life. She was Rukmini, my great-grandmother. She was 90 when she died last month, outliving by 10 years her only son and daughter-in-law. I don't know how she felt when they died, but later she seemed to find something slightly hilarious about it all, that she, an ignorant village-bred woman who signed the papers my father brought her with a thumbprint, should survive, while they, city-bred, ambitious, should collapse of weak hearts and arthritic knees at the first sign of old age. Her sense of humor was always quaint. It could also be embarrassing. She would sit in her corner, her round, plump face reddening, giggling like a little girl. I knew better than ask her why. I was a teenager by then. But some uninitiated friend would be unable to resist and would go up to my great-grandmother and ask her why she was laughing. This, I knew, would send her into uncontrollable peals. The tears would flow down her cheeks, and finally, catching her breath, still weak with laughter, she would confess. She could fart exactly like a train whistling its way out of the station, and it gave her as much joy as a child would get when she saw or heard a train. So perhaps it is not all that surprising that she could be so flippant about her only child's death, especially since 10 years had passed. Yes, Ratna. You study hard and become a big doctor, madam, she would chuckle, when I kept the lights on all night and paced up and down the room, reading to myself. The last time I saw a doctor, I was 30 years old. Your grandfather was in the hospital for three months. He would faint every time he saw his own blood. And as if that summed up the progress made between two generations, she would pull her blanket over her head and begin snoring almost immediately. I have two rooms, the entire downstairs to myself now, since my great-grandmother died. I began my course at medical school next month and I am afraid to be here alone at night. I have to live up to the gold medal I won last year. I keep late hours reading my anatomy textbook before the course begins. The body is a solid, reliable thing. It is a wonderful, resilient machine. I hold on to the thick, hardbound book and flip through the new smelling pages greedily. I stop every time I find an illustration and look at it closely. It reduces us to pink, blue and white, color-coded, labeled parts, muscles, veins, tendons. Everything has a name, everything in linked, one with the other, all parts of a functioning whole. It is poor consolation for the nights I have spent in her warm bed, surrounded by that safe, familiar, musty smell. She was cheerful and never sick, but she was also undeniably old. And so it was not a great surprise to us when she suddenly took to lying in bed all day a few weeks before her 90th birthday. 
She had been lying in bed for close to two months, ignoring concern, advice, scolding. And then she suddenly gave up. She agreed to see a doctor. The young doctor came out of her room, his face puzzled and angry. My father begged him to sit down and drink a cup of coffee. She will need all kinds of tests, he announced. How long has she had that lump on her neck? Have you had it checked? My father shifted uneasily in his cane chair. He is a cadaverous looking man, prone to nervousness and sweating. He keeps a big jar of antacids on his office desk. He has a nine to five accountant's job in a government owned company, the kind that never fires its employees. My father pulled out the small towel he uses in place of a handkerchief. Wiping his forehead, he mumbled, you know how these old women are, impossible to argue with them. The neck, the doctor said more gently. I could see he pitied my father. I think it was examined once, long ago. My father was alive then. There was supposed to have been an operation, I think. But you know what they thought in those days. An operation meant a natural death. All the relatives came over to scare her, advise her with horror stories. So she said no. You know how it is. And she was already a widow then. My father was the head of the household. How could he, a 14-year-old, take the responsibility? Hmm, said the doctor. He shrugged his shoulders. Let me know when you want me to admit her in my nursing home. But I suppose it's better to let her die at home. When the doctor left, we looked at each other, the three of us like shifty accomplices. My mother, practical as always, broke the silence and said, let's not tell her anything. Why worry her? And then we'll have all kinds of difficult old aunts and cousins visiting. It'll be such a nuisance. How will Ratna study in the middle of all that chaos? But when I went into her room that night, my great-grandmother had a sly look on her face. Come here, Ratna, she said. Come here, my darling little gem. I went, my heart quaking at the thought of telling her. She held my hand and kissed each finger, her half-closed eyes almost flirtatious. Tell me something, Ratna, she began in a wheedling voice. I don't know. I don't know anything about it, I said quickly. Of course you do. She was surprised, a little annoyed. Those small cakes you got from the Christian shop that day, do they have eggs in them? Do they? She persisted. Will you? And her eyes narrowed with cunning. Will you get one for me? So we began a strange partnership, my great-grandmother and I. I smuggled cakes and ice cream, biscuits and samosas, made by non-Brahmin hands into a vegetarian invalid's room, to the deathbed of a Brahmin widow who had never eaten anything but pure home-cooked food for almost a century. She would grab it from my hand late at night after my parents had gone to sleep. She would hold the pastry in her finger, turn it over round and round, as if on the verge of an earth-shaking discovery. And does it really have egg in it? She would ask again, as if she needed the password for her to bite into it with her gums. Yes, yes, I would say, a little tired of midnight feasts by then. The pastries were a cheap yellow color, topped by white frosting with hard gray pearls. Lots and lots of eggs, I would say wanting her to hurry up and put it in her mouth. And the bakery is owned by a Christian. I think he hires Muslim cooks too. Ooh, she would sigh. Her little pink tongue darted out and licked the frosting. Her toothless mouth worked its way steadily, munching, making happy, sucking noises. Our secret was safe for about a week. Then she became bored. She was bored with cakes, she said. They gave her heartburn. She became a little more adventurous every day. Her cravings were various and unpredictable, laughable, and always urgent. I'm thirsty, she moaned, when my mother asked her if she wanted anything. No, no, I don't want water. I don't want juice. She stopped the morning and looked at my mother's patient, exasperated face. I'll tell you what I want, she whined. Get me a glass of that brown drink Ratna bought in the bottle. The kind that bubbles and makes a popping sound when you open the bottle. The one with the fizzy noise as you pour it out. A Coca-Cola, said my mother, shocked. Don't be silly, it will make you sick. I don't care what it is called, my great-grandmother said, and started moaning again, I want it. So she got it, and my mother poured out a small glass, tight-lipped, and gave it to her without a word. She was always a dutiful granddaughter-in-law. Ah, sighed my great-grandmother, propped up against her pillows, the steel tumbler lifted high over her lips. The lump on her neck moved in little gurgles as she drank. Then she burped a loud, contented burp and asked, 
as if she had just thought of it. Do you think there's something in it? You know, alcohol? A month later, we had got used to her new unexpected inappropriate demands. She had tasted, by now, lemon tarts, garlic, three types of aerated drinks, fruit cake placed with brandy, bail puri from the fly invested bazaar nearby. There's going to be trouble, my mother kept muttering under her breath. She's losing her mind. She's going to be a lot of trouble. And she was right, of course. My great-grandmother could no longer swallow very well. She would pour the coke into her mouth and half of it would trickle out of her nostrils, thick, brown, nauseating. It burns, it burns, she would yell then. But she pursed her lips tightly together when my mother spooned a thin gruel into her mouth. No, no, she screamed deliriously. Get me something from the bazaar. Raw onions, fried bread, chickens and goats. Then we knew she was lost to us. She was dying. My grandmother was in the nursing home for 10 whole days. My mother and I took turns sitting by her, sleeping on the floor by the hospital cot. She lay there quietly, the pendulous neck almost as big as her face, but she would not let the nurses near her bed. She would squirm and wriggle like a big fish that refused to be caught. The sheet smelled and the young doctor shook his head. Not much to be done now, he said. The cancer has left nothing intact. The day she died, she kept searching the room with her eyes. Her arms were held down by the tubes and needles, crisscross, in, out. The glucose dripped into her veins, but her nose still ran, the clear, thin liquid trickling down like dribble onto her chin. Her hands clenched and unclenched with the effort, and she whispered like a miracle, up now. My mother and I rushed to her bedside. Tears streamed down her face. My mother bent her head before her and pleaded, give me your blessings, Patti. Bless me before you go. My great-grandmother looked at her for a minute, her lips working furiously, noiselessly. For the first time in my life, I saw a fine veil of perspiration on her face. The muscles on her face twitched in mad, frenzied jerks. <coughs> Sorry. Then she pulled one arm free of the tubes in a sudden crazy spurt of strength, and the IV pole crashed to the floor. Bring me a red saudi, she screamed, a red one with a big white border of gold. And her voice crackled. Bring me peanuts with chili powder from the corner shop, onion and green chili bondas, deep fried in oil. Then the voice gurgled and gurgled. Her face and neck swayed, rocked like a boat lost in the swami sea. She retched, and as the vomit flew out of her mouth and her nose, thick like the milkshake she had drunk, brown like the alcoholic cake, her head slumped forward, her rounded chin buried in the cancerous neck. When we brought the body home, I am not yet a doctor, and already I can call her that. I helped my mother wipe her clean with wet, soft cloth. We wiped away the smells, the smell of the hospital bed, the smell of an old woman's juices drying. Her skin was dry and papery. The stubble on her head, she had refused to shave her head when she got sick, had grown like the soft white bristles of a hairbrush. She had had only one child, though she had lived so long. But the skin on her stomach was like crumpled frayed velvet, the creases running to and fro in fine silvery rivulets. Bring her sari, my mother whispered, as if my great-grandmother could still hear. <clears throat> I looked at the stiff, cold body that I was seeing naked for the first time. She was asleep at last, quiet at last. I had learned in the last month or two to expect the unexpected from her. I waited in case she changed her mind and sat up, remembering one more taboo food to be tasted. Bring me your eyebrow tweezers, I heard her say. Bring me that hair removing cream. I have a mustache and I don't want to be an ugly old woman. But she lay still, the wads of cotton in her nostrils and ears, shutting us out, shutting out her belated ardor. I ran to my cupboard and brought her the brightest, reddest sari I could find. Last year's Diwali sari, my first silk. I unfolded it, ignoring my mother's eyes, which were turning aghast. I covered her naked body lovingly. The red silk glittered like her childish laughter. Have you gone mad? My mother whispered furiously. She was a sick old woman. She didn't know what she was saying. She rolled up the sari and flung it aside as if it had been polluted. She wiped the body again to free it from foolish, trivial desires. They burnt her in a pale brown sari, in widow's weeds. The prayer beads I had never seen her touch encircled the bulging, obscene neck. 
I am still a novice at anatomy. I hover just over the body. I am just beneath the skin. I have yet to look at the insides, the entrails of memory she told me nothing about, the pain congealing into a cancer. She has left me behind with nothing but a smell, a legacy that grows fainter every day. For a while, I haunt the dirtiest bakeries and tea stalls I can find. I search for her, my sweet great-grandmother, in plate after plate of stale confections, in needle sharp green chilies deep fried in rancid oil. I plot her revenge for her. I give myself diarrhea for a week. Then I open all the windows and her cupboards and air the rooms. I tear her dirty gray saris to shreds. I line the shelves of her empty cupboard with my thick, newly born, gloss te jacketed texts. They stand straight and solid, row after row of armed soldiers. They fill up the small cupboard quickly. <coughs> Sorry. Thoughts? Let's go around the room. Arun, what did you make of the story? Mute. It's, it's, it's a, it's, yeah, it's a beautiful story. Uh, it's an Indian story. So I see it this way that as an Indian writer, if I'm writing, I should write like this. Uh, the plot line is very close, very close to my life. I have seen this. Um, capturing it this way is very emotional also very emotional at the end especially mm. uh, the way uh, you know the death happens and after that this i don't know this i don't i shouldn't call this a resolution but there is this place right after death mm. where she's taking revenge almost taking revenge and then at the same time she's also filling up the cupboards with the medical textbooks and she's becoming a doctor that portion is wonderful wonderful of course the best part is how a uh, uh, great grandmother is asking for different kinds of foods it's <laughs> one hand humorous other hand tragic this this uh, in front of i mean when someone is facing death at that time that the deepest desires the wants are coming out wonderful wonderful described Lot. Yeah, I just I somehow I, I I thought that everyone would really find a way into this story more than almost any other story I've read this session because it's so Indian, it's so original in that it is very organic, right? You can even I don't know if it's fiction or not, but I you can believe it, and all of us it's it runs parallel to some part of our life that we would have had. It. And that, that is a very special relation between the child and the grandparent. The parents are the lawmakers, they're the fun killers. But the grandchild and the grandparent have a different relationship. They're kind of their confidant. They, they, the grandparent will never hear, hear anything bad about the grandchild. It's beautiful. So yeah, I, this story really worked for me too. Yeah, she, she reveres her and then in the end she has to replace her. That's the inexorable trust of life. In some way. So yeah, thanks. Um, Chaitali, what did you think of the story? Uh, this was very relatable, uh, especially since I lost my grandmother just last year, and even my uh, maternal grandmother just two, three months back. So uh, the behavior of all people, like sudden demands, unpredictable, unpredictable demands, that was very relatable. Like they become very childlike, and there's no censor. And uh, so that kind of behavior felt very familiar. And uh, so, so this was, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the story. It felt very uh, closer to home. Yeah, I think it's, it, it's kind of almost, I don't want to say painfully close, but it's really close to the heart, the story, more than a lot of others. I've read tons of short stories and I love American and British and Irish also. Gita Haryan stories and even more than Arkan Einstein, some, some Indian short stories, they really cut to the bone in a way that, you know, it's, it's you can kind of layer on top of our life, or layer our life on top of it. And, this, and the scenario is so uh, sort of believable. 
it is yeah. uh, as organic as you get with this story because uh, she is just trying uh, she is close to the grandmother and she is just trying to fulfill whatever demands are there irrespective of its uh, what do like uh, spoil her health no she doesn't care her grandmother asked for a sari she will give it so because she is close to her on the other hand the mother is oh no she didn't know what she was talking about and the mother that. is the boss so, in so she got that yeah so uh, that also, kind of uh, yeah dynamic also even that uh, sort of push ke okay no she is asking for it but no it's not right it's yeah, not ethical what or about. whatever so that kind of also plays out a lot another thing i liked about it is that it showed I and mean, this is one of i read this a long time ago and until then i did not realize that you could write stories about things like this and you know that you could not stories about people like this and if you look at it there's a 20 year old girl her grandmother dies that's it's a it's like an anecdote right? it, 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 when someone passes away and they come you can say and the visitors come you tell them oh in her last days she wanted to eat full of jamun and but that's it, you you kind of and she's not padding it i don't i don't think she's padding the incident. she's filling it with real details of life the flesh and blood of life i think that's the beauty of it that's why it works so well in terms of when you read it it almost feels like confession the way she's done it yeah and the yeah. grandmother's character also comes out so well in the uh, depictions that she's done okay she would just laugh and giggle like a girl because like they're not her son. She's, yeah. she's almost she's proud that she's outlived her son that's i like yeah, that yeah i sort of the audio is going that is very okay yeah, yeah. so okay. even that felt very uh, relatable to the people i've observed especially the elderly like yeah it's nice it's not politically correct they cut from a different cloth absolutely definitely yeah thanks uh, just a story wise uh, critique wise if i had to change anything uh, i think the second last para was more powerful for me than the last so the part where i would have been looking for her in yeah she uh, she ends okay. that with i gave myself the idea for a week that felt much more powerful Than like the books. It rested so, more with me. It sat with me more than the last para. So maybe I was reading much more into it, but uh, I felt that had a more emotional impact for me, no, I think at that's least. Fair, that's, so that's... I would have ended on that para and brought the last a bit mm-hmm. earlier, okay. just for uh, otherwise I thoroughly that's enjoyed nice. the piece. Yeah. No, it's good. Um. Thanks. Uh, Girija, what did you think of the yeah. story? Yeah. What I really liked about this story was obviously the grandma's character. I think I've never read something like that. Um, you know, you always have people who know that they're about to die tell someone else that you know fulfill these wishes for me. You know, say why don't you get married or you know why don't you have kids or you know they have they want to live through someone else and you know it's something you know it's but with the granny here she she wants to do everything herself like she lives for herself till the very end and i think that was very powerful for me it was mm-hmm. not about you know you know even when the the grand great granddaughter says like you know give me your blessing she's like okay like i want my red sari and you know i think that was crazy amazing for me i've not read anything like that but it seemed like i mean there's so many lenses through which you can analyze this but just mm-hmm. the intergenerational conflict that you can also notice through um the the great great granddaughter her mom and then the great grandmom so you know the um the mom obviously has this voice where you know like you said law and order i i found this materialistic or rather the capitalist lens with through which we can analyze the mom's voice because she's like oh no you know we can't have too many guests over because she needs to study for her uh, medical exam so uh like just the, that characterization there through dialogues and these very like you know mm. it's so crisp there's no extra wording anywhere it's there's so much both to the, both the, yeah both the mother and the father are, are sketched in just two lines you know he just says that my father works at this place where you'll never get fired and yeah it's almost like <laughs> cadaverous looking in that and we all immediately know him completely and yeah. the thing about her how her mother says we don't want all these people because that now won't be able to study 
first of all, I, I think that maybe her mother didn't want all those visitors because they'll all be talking in a year. Yeah. And she was using Ratna studies as partly an excuse. But it also reminded me of the, the premium we, pay, we place in our families on education above anything else, right? I mean, in, in, in Amitav Ghosh's shadow lines, he, he's very close to his grandmother and he goes and studies in Delhi. And uh, he has an exam. And uh, after his exams, he calls home or something like that and tells him his grandmother died 10 days ago. And he asks them, why didn't you tell me? They said, no, no, you were in the middle of your exams. You couldn't come down. And he, he's very struck by that. So he takes a bus, he goes somewhere in Delhi and he sits, he sits in a park and he says something. He says something very affecting. He says, uh, I, I thought of the world we lived in where exams and tests were more important than the death of somebody in the family. And it's, that was completely relatable to me. And I'm sure it's probably related to all of you. This, that, this thing reminded me of that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I also felt like there were two parallel lines. I mean, obviously there's this mm -hmm. intertwined uh, storyline, but there was, you know, the granny who's, that, that moment where she knows she's going to die, like after the doctor, doctor visits, but she doesn't mm -hmm. ask what the doctor said. Instead says, I want to do this. Like that, that was just like the moment for me. Um, you know, that I think she just decides like, you know, all this life I've followed so many rules of you know society of my family and now i just no i just have only so much time and i want to do what i want to do that sort of thing so i think through the imagery it just comes out bang yeah. on. another point was that the grandmother is finally kind of letting go of her responsibilities and doing whatever she wants to do and this girl already at 20 she says i have to do good i have to i have to do i've already got a gold medal and you kind of feel that she's so committed to her responsibilities right so she also is something like I have to prove my that my gold medal. It's like that's the kind of thing that we put on ourselves. Like, oh, they, they made so many sacrifices. They oh. want me to be a doctor. They made some. They put this, and you just before you know it, <laughs> you're at the other end of the conveyor belt, and you're asking for jalebis from small schools. So I think that there was that contrast between the granddaughter and possibly the granddaughter is going to end up doing the same thing. You know, she's going to you know live, live somebody else's life a little bit, and maybe regret at the very end. But yeah, thanks, yeah. Kirita. Yeah, assume it. Uh, I, uh, the part about the story was relating yeah. the grandmother to the medical side. Her studies going on simultaneously, anatomy. And then uh, very quietly she has written, I have never gone beyond skin. And still, I haven't gone under the skin. So uh, that, that was the part I enjoyed most. No, and, she was parallel. She was using examples from the fact that she's a first year, second year medical student or whatever. Gone. Yes. Sorry? And of course, that burden of tradition, you can see mm -hmm. the old yes. woman, that uh, how much she accepted willingly, how much was posed on her is a question again. And at the end, of course, she rebelled. She decided to be well, out. She doesn't there. rebel, right? She, she kind of tears up her grandmother's sari. So she puts up her books and she's going to follow that course. She doesn't yeah. rebel. She says, um, "Grandmother herself, she decides to do away she with puts what." Puts her grandmother's memory to yeah. to one side. I think she parks her grandmother's trees, but she says, "I have to live up to the gold medal I won last year. I have to." That that's a very important thing. She doesn't say, "I had won a gold medal and I was looking forward to medical." She says, "I have right. to." It's already you know, her course is charted for her, and uh, it's like before you, it's a it's a big warning, big flag that before you know it, you'll be ninety, and then. You have to wait for cancer to come to release you to some freedom. But yeah, thanks, Manjali. Thank you. Sumit, I don't know. Sumit? Yeah. yeah. You... What did you think of this story? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I liked it. Uh, it was not relatable, relatable because my grandmother lost her memory by the end. Yeah. Uh, well, it's not exactly relatable. Yeah. So, I mean, like, I, people say that, the, that uh, the grandmother behaved childlike, but no, I mean, it was very violent to form oh. my grandmother, so I can't. But the way the story is written, uh, yeah, we have to we have to analyze the story on two levels. As, one a, is as a story, you can have personal memory. The other one is yeah. like Chaitali did like from a craft point of view. The characters, characters really stand, they're very Indian characters, and yes. you can see them around you. Because a mother, when you write story right like this. Uh, it's a high probability that the characters can become a bit one note. It's it's okay. nice that the mother is a bit uh, rational no thinking, um, mm. and it, it's it's typical of 
someone would do this why the nice sari on a dead dead woman no right? it's it makes she's, perfect she's sense dead, right? yeah <laughs> and also the thing about the mother is that when she realizes the grandmother is dying dying she runs to and says please give me your asirvadam's party which is what you do and we, we, i can sense that the grandmother kind of loathed wanting to do that any more and that's why she looked at her like that she like i'm done with this you know yeah. i'm i'm on my way out i don't want to fulfill any of these traditional roles anymore but the they are like that they will go people will go and ask blessings even for someone who they say they hate you no no we want your blessing that's 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 almost like conforming to a habit that makes you feel happier yeah i liked how 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 efficient the characterization was of the father and the mother just yeah. just a couple of lines and also and the, the, the father was uh, it it also balances their relationship right the father was a bit cowering right. kind of guy yeah. so yeah. she did, yeah. she needed to be the one uh, who, who takes in charge is it somebody charge. has to kind of guide the family a little yeah. bit in that way, yeah and she's i think she's dead on it sounds hard but the girl wants to give the grandmother sari the mother is dead on this is your first silk don't be crazy you know <laughs> and and then there's a small dig about how the the beads that i never saw her playing with over around her neck so they kind of force yeah. there they because that is more of what people look at you know did they do it religiously because people yeah. will go away and talk hey you know when they buried so and so they didn't even have this she was wearing her nose ring they took it away i don't know who got it like how, somehow in some realm that's the most important thing that they take away so yeah that tells a little little things right uh, when she says that the shop belong to a christian and he has a muslim ah, worker she's I, like I, I should, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, two levels two yeah. levels of blasphemy uh, i'm committing uh, yeah. of uh, impropriety right it's not just the egg it's also uh, a christian yeah. and it's also a muslim so what else do you want you know it's like it's it's like three in one the great goal for her Swati, what did you make of the story? You're on I'm mute. Yeah. Did I? Uh, I was when I was just looking at how she switched from one one idea to the next to the next, and I was like, how did she get it to flow so much? I, I am not sure whether I know how to do that, or if I do, I do that. I'm not sure, but I was quite surprised that while reading it, that how it flowed from. the smell of the room to what her uh, to the description of her grandmother and then the descriptions were all so generic descriptions they are in one way very precise on the other hand it could be anybody's grandmother you know uh, who's giggling who's uh, laughing at yeah. fart jokes it could be anybody's mother because you know it's a mother who's worried about the studies and stuff Uh, it could be anybody's father who's or or some relative or the other who happens to have a very government secure job or whatever secure job where most people didn't re- retire for years or it ne- never changed jobs for years it just is so typical of that generation it doesn't really matter whether they're government or not even private sector people never le- left their companies so on one hand it's very precise on the other hand it could be anybody So it's very precise, but it's very representative. That's what you're trying to say. I think it's not only generic. Right, right. Representative. Family has to call the father yeah. and mother. Like that. So, that's right. So it's it's it it becomes by by being specific about her mother and father. She's also she showing. She doesn't talk about whether the grandmother is short or not, or wrinkly or curly hair or straight hair. None of that description is there. Because that. She talks the, about her hair. No? She 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 just takes her hair off and it's white and so a little bit. But I know what you mean. You yeah, can I mean, kind of impose a lot on it. She is not. she is not del she is not gone deep into saying that my grandmother was a tall woman bony hands none of that stuff none exactly. of that but right maybe right. your grandmother is not uh, that way maybe your grandmother is huge or she's has uh, straight uh, hair or curly hair so this doesn't interfere with your imagination of what that lady is because you're superimposing it on whoever you know the people you know and uh, it's so easy to do it because it's generic in a way and yet it's very uh very very descriptive and very easy to visualize who that person is on the other hand i yeah, thought I, mean, i think no, the grandmother's description with the physical uh, body and the neck and i think it was uh, quite vivid so that, in some cases it was a bit nauseating for me it's like a bit was, too much yeah, yeah so yeah so the vomiting and the excretion yeah the yeah. that was that was that was almost sensory almost act i think the way she did that but yeah but do you think she was deliberately not 
well, saying that his grandmother could be your grandmother. Why is she doing? How is how is that effect? Because apart from the goiter, she doesn't describe anything about the grandmother, right? Or the goiter, and she doesn't have teeth. Which is a, apart from that, you don't have any physical description of anybody in the house. Actually, you don't know whether the mother is thin, long, thin. No, thin, but lean. she gives in fact in in between pieces, she gives a lot of. She describes the grandmother's hair. She uh, says even though she lived a long that life, she had just one baby. Yes. She describes her stomach. That she's the stomach. Yeah, so she's the red hair that that goes red. Ne? She says she had a plum face and so grey stuff. So it's interspersed. Uh, yes. What does she say? Red what? Her I'm sorry. plum face, which became red when she laughed. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Some red when she laughed. So plum face. And the stubble which she refused to get it shaved. Mm. That was like. Also, the angry red belt on her back. But that comes later in the story, right? Yeah, correct. So you've already, I think, it comes later in the story. So you've already, for me at least, I was already thinking of so many people who I could superimpose this person on. One thing is that even if she hadn't brought in that medical parallel, I think the story would have worked just as well. Do you know what I'm saying? When she talks about, I'm studying anatomy and I'm only at the skin. And I like yeah. what she tried to do with it, but it seemed a little forced, a little bit. The story works, yeah. whatever the granddaughter's without profession, subject, yeah. she could have been engineering, she could have been this, even without that, it works. And also that mala on the throat, it's just so funny, I mean, it says the God is on your throat, the, the very throat that caused you cancer is, you know, that's where all of your faith and all of your uh, prayers have gone to. <laughs> I mean, that contrast was very... But they only put it on after she's dead, right? Yeah, the, the yeah, yeah. yeah. He's dead and she now... Never, yeah, she never touched it. So that's the, that's the important it. point. Yet it's something that represents faith in uh, your uh, what you're praying for yes, day yeah. after day, and then it's right. What what is it laying against? Against that very throat, uh, the cancer. Correct. Just cancer oh, that kills her. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. True. Maybe it'll dig against the uh, religious. Well, not dig against again. Not, not the grandmother didn't have faith enough to use it. So it was the other, the son, the grandson, not even the son. Right? So she's a great grandmother. That means she's, she's a great grandmother. Her grandmother's dad's grandmother. Her okay, grandmother's yeah, grandmother. yeah. So there's there's a there's, there's one generation completely gone, and then the so second generation. The her reaction to that is the most shocking part of this story for me. Uh, where she's laughing. Yeah, where she's laughing that. She's outlived. Well, that makes uh, it so real, though. That makes yeah. it so real. Uh, that, yeah. But that feels so real. It, that's the, the, I've seen people like that. Who they, yes. they, you go, to, you go, you go you, you, I mean, I've, I remember coming back from visiting someone in the hospital and my aunt was there. She was like 80 plus or whatever. And she was unwell. And I went to her and I was feeling full of I don't know, sympathy for my friend who was in the hospital or whatever. And I sat down and told her. And she was very, you know, mean and cutting. And she was like, oh. And it, it's almost like it was almost like a medical point of view, you know, like so many people have it, don't get too hung up that your friend is at it. And I was a bit surprised. I thought I thought she was this, like this kind, gentle old woman, big eye opener for me. But it's so real the way the grandmother, like, oh, hey, look, all of them studied, and they are heart attacks and outside of Look yeah. at me going on. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Um, let's go. Alka, yeah. Your take on the story. Um, actually, you know, when I read it for the first time, uh, before you read it, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I felt, you know, like uh, the pace, uh, somehow I felt it's too uh, fast. Uh, and I, I wanted to get the feel of that pastry that, you know, it's a yellow color with the white icing. And yes, you know, like it was like I wanted to think about it because that icing is really, you know, it's like hard, very sugary icing. 
and then before uh, i could imagine that i was in the next and next and next and then i said my god why is she go going at this pace where i can't imagine the first part and i'm going to the next one and then i realized why am, why am i reading that fast <laughs> so the pace is set by the writer in such a way that it is it is you don't have the control you don't have the control the flow that it takes you along so you know you go at that speed so the first reading good that you know i read it first and then now we're reading with you mm. it's a sort of you know like then get into the way and yes it was very organic i could um, relate to it because i saw my mother and mother in law both my mother in law used to drink coke like that i had to hide the bottles finally you know so <laughs> not dependent on me giving it to her so i had to finally do that and somehow i also felt here you know the what she has actually highlighted is that the relationship between great granddaughter and this uh, mother in law i mean grand, uh, great uh, 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 the mother, grandmother in law was duty bound and we, this great granddaughter and great grandmother is love bound so you know uh, i mean they can identify with each other in certain ways so that is why i was surprised when she said that the smell of uh, roses you know she said that uh, and that too elusive the fragrance and wherever the description there is nothing that could have uh, been fragrant she is eating like this she is farting she is vomiting she is every i mean she, cancer has uh, taken over the whole so there is an, and the bed so so what could be the reason for um, the smell of roses well, i think she's talking about she remembers that right hmm? that's that's earlier memories right that's what she's talking no, she about says, she says the complete room i mean after her passing away she says that everything in that uh, this thing was that a uh, smell of the rose which is uh, um, you know elusive fragrance see the first, uh, right in the beginning so she says ki she smells it not when as she was dying but she says not as she that. did when she was dying but before but that, everything right? not but everything it clung to everything and that she no, but uh, when she She says, "Who's in the nursing now, home?" Right? Like a desecrated rose, right? Like a rose. That's she's saying that. And she's, she, I think she does. The, this is a nice thing. Burn a candle, put out. This is. I like this. These two lines, actually. Yes, yes. That's what I'm saying. But why it is a pressed, faded rose? Of uh, this, she has got good memories. You know, she thinks you know, like everything nice. So otherwise, one would have said, "I would. I remember the death. I mean, that death is." So beautiful than uh, this thing, but for her it is that faded rose. I was surprised. I was surprised because you know that there's a different smell of a dying person, of a bedridden person. But here she has described it. I think that's because the you know, she relates to her great grandmother, and I felt it that way because it was so out of place for me. Beautiful lines, but. Mm. somebody saying that the room smells like a pressed faded rose so before she was bedridden those memories are playing a part here hmm i feel that those uh, not the last 10 days or last uh, month or two oh, well, the last 10 days she was in hospital last That's she right. was in hospital yeah, she was in that Before that, she was at home, you know. Even at home. Yeah, but she was just eating. She was just snacking on stuff, right? Why would that? Yeah, and bad? she was bedridden only for the last ten days. She yeah, but eating those snacks would not make it a bad smell, right? I mean, she's just eating for the pakora. No, no. She both. said that it it would come out of her nose. The coke would also dribble, and the you know it was not that she was actively. Moving. Yeah, but that everything happened in the nursing home, right? When she's on the bed. I think the dripping and all happened at the very end. Yeah. It, it cannot be that she was. She was not. That's why the doctor got angry. She was bedridden. She, she was hospitalized for ten days, but the doctor got angry because she has already reached that stage. I presumed it was because, uh, like for my grandmother, I think of a particular hair, uh, uh, hair oil scent, uh, some powders that she used. There was a smell that I associate with my grandmother. With my mother, on the other hand, I have the 
smell of pledge uh, furniture polish, you know, lemon scented furniture polish, because that's what she used to see, use uh, furniture polish a lot. I mean, uh, so, uh, so I think I, that's what I presume that, you know, probably her grandmother used some rose flavored, but I've never smelled any rose flavored uh, oils or powders, frankly, but I presume that's what. She, why? Maybe she used the attar or something, something that was rose smelling. Because I still associate my grandmother and my mother with various smells. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then also the, the way she has described, you know, a camel's hump. And it's so, hey, that, uh, you know, fits the description so well that, yeah, it would look like that with her. With her uh, and, uh, like the way you know the way everyone has taken I every mean, it's something here about death the death of uh, the um, grandparents i mean for the great grandmother death of her son daughter in law and now this again this one more death but all deaths are you know like it's kind of treated um, you know not in the way that uh, make too much of uh, about it too much of uh, unnecessary importance given to no, I think her son and daughter-in-law have been dead for ten years, so she's she's had time to process it, I guess. But then she's After she's her, taking it like she finds it hilarious, or this. Uh, yeah, but it's, but but the uh, the narrator says that it may be because it's been ten years after the event, so yes. time heals yeah. a lot of wounds. That's definitely that. So I feel I mean there's no unnecessary importance given to that part. I feel that. that no, it was more. I think the, the point of that is, was to show that she was having these real, I mean, it was not, you know, um, not a story you read in moral science where old people are all reverential and praying all the time and saying, I miss so-and-so and my son died, my life ended. That's not true. So she, her life goes on and she's, she's able to even look at it and say, look, I outlived them and for all their things. So that's a very human, very real thing. I, that, that's one of the best parts of the story for me in terms of one of the highlights. And it sums up her character so well so well right that single line it makes her original but i didn't understand you with just that line you know she's a survivor she will survive correct alka what didn't you understand i didn't understand when she says they're city bred that's her son and daughter in law she's talking about how can uh -huh. they city bred when she's in a thing what do you mean? Couldn't they have yeah. left her and couldn't they wouldn't she have been in the village and gone and they could have gone to the city and studied, right? I don't understand. City, there's, there's no there's no evidence there. that it's not like that. I don't understand why that's a disagreement to you. Why that's a question to you. I think that's the beauty of this, you know, the city bread, they think so much of themselves because they did they're from the city and all. And what happened? They died before me big deal and they they always kept on saying life in the village is so bad so bad so bad well guess what i've lived much longer than them you know and i've never been to a doctor your father also didn't know how to be you know she's making there are people like that. there are people who are really old who never been to the doctor and are extremely proud of it and yeah. even if they're kind of weak they, they're very proud that they've never been to a doctor and Um, yeah, okay. Thanks, Alka. Um, Advait? I don't know if there. You've been very quiet. Hi, there. Good. Hi, 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 everyone. So, what did you think of the story? Well, it's hands down one of the most beautiful uh, short stories that I've ever read. Uh, particularly, I love the uh, transformation of the great granddaughter. Uh, that was portrayed before and after the uh, death. You know, mm -hmm. at first uh, she was, you know, just telling her, yeah, there are lots and eggs of it. And probably the baker was, uh, the bakery was Christian and he hired Muslim uh, bakers just to, you know, uh, go, just, just so she could go to sleep. And then later on, on the day her uh, great grandmother died, you know, she had asked for the red sari. So, you know, when, when they brought her body home, she just went uh, quickly and, and she brought her red sari because she had asked for it. I love that trans transformation of the character and 
Yeah, that, that's what do, you, what do you mean by transformation? What did she transform from and what did she transform to? So earlier she, well, she want, just wanted to go to sleep. So yeah, she wanted to hurry the conversation. Uh, so, you know, that part, uh, I guess I'm not able to uh, express it properly, but yeah, she just wanted to go to sleep and she said that, okay, there are a lot of eggs in the cake. And later on, she, uh, she kept remembering of that one request her great grandmother uh, had, to bring me the sari. And she went in and she got the, uh, the silk sari that uh, she had gotten in Diwali. So for a crops to be uh, draped in silk sari, that, that's a bit uh, expensive choice, you can say. And her mother said, okay, she was dying. Uh, she didn't know what she was saying. But regardless, she wanted to drape her in uh, the red sari. So I, I love that. The, those two actions that uh, the writer had uh, described. Mm. I have so a question. Do you guys think it would have been a different story if the elder person had just been the grandmother? So what is the impact of her being her great grandmother? The only relationship it really affects in my head is that it affects the mother of the narrator because if it was the grandmother, then the mother of the narrator would have been her daughter-in-law, then there would have been a lot of that that relationship would be complex in a different way. But a woman sense of, it's, it's almost only duty to her, well, I don't know what the word is, her husband's grandmother, right? That's what she is. So it becomes, it. I mean, I transcribed the story and every time I was writing, I was like, why didn't Gita even just say grandmother? And I told him, why did she say great grandmother? Why did she have to make it three generations between, between the the older lady and the young. Do you guys think that? I, I don't. I mean, obviously she did it for a reason. But I'm just trying to think of what do you think the reason is? Anybody? For me, I, it was very obvious. Grandmother, um, a mother. She's not talking. She's uh, A parent and a child. So by skipping a generation, it's so much. Easier. Oh, I'll, I'll mute myself. Please. please do, because there's a lot of noise behind you. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. It's so much easier to get over the anger, frustrations that a parent has with the uh, between a parent and child. If it would have been grandmother, then uh, the middle generation would have been angry. But here, the, there was not that. I mean, there is some anger at some point or irritation at something or the other. But here, it's a grandmother that the parents are dealing with, so they don't have that anger at all. So yes, it's serious, but. Uh, that there's no irritation as such, which I, I think any child and parent has at some point when you're dealing with death and life and death situations, there's some, some irritation of some sort, sometimes, somewhere, especially when it's life and death. Okay. I think uh, I would say, thank you, know, that son and daughter in law would have been more confrontational, more assertive. But in this case, you know, because they are grandson and uh, granddaughter-in-law, they are not able to force her to mm. do anything. So yeah. it becomes, they don't have that, like, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah I yes. see what you're saying. If it's a grandmother, the son and daughter, like, we take care of you, we're responsible, do this, do that. Because mm. it's one generation above, they can't really say that. They kind of have to just say, party, will you? And she can pretty much have free reign somewhere. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I was thinking about that. Okay, um, I mean, we haven't spoken yet. Uh, Snehal and Urmila, just just one second. Uh, Snehal, what did you think of the story? I, I know you joined a little late. Snehal? Uh, yeah, very, uh, I mean, I could relate to it because the, particularly the, you know, the sights and smells of the room where the old lady lay dying. Because I've, at first hand, I've seen it with my uh, relatives, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, another uh, I I thought that she her use of her language is really uh, I mean it's very evocative because she doesn't waste any words anywhere. You know, I mean, you get the complete sense of the story right through, and I can identify with the 
like you said, not relatable. Relatable in the sense that uh, I lost a 93-year-old aunt who had um, outlived all her siblings. Yeah. And in the end also, you know, you expect old, aid, old people to become very religious or spiritual <laughs> or something like that. And, you know, means like uh, this thing. But she was, uh, she was a survivor. She was a fighter. She had no health problems. It was only old age. And the most vivid memory of her, her I have is that when she was in the hospital, where they took her because she fainted at home. And when uh, she came out of the faint, they said, uh, you know, she said, I'm fine. I want to go home. And what kind of bed is there? The, is this the blankets don't smell, are dirty? You know, that sort of a thing. It means people, and even at that age, they are very uh, aware of everything. I don't know how, it's like, uh, it reminded me this also of the old lady, you know, looking for, I mean, like enjoying herself towards the end. That was, uh, that's typical of a lot of old people, uh, these thing people, you see. But they are not it, really, not really going into all this, you know, like uh, they are expected to, you know, uh, be, uh, be sort of uh, waiting for death in a very dignified way or something like that. No, it's not like that. They're true to their and, personalities yeah. to the end. You so know, at least, so that was very true them. Yeah. So, but what yeah, do you think true to them, sir. Sorry? You know, Snell, I felt it was like, you know, this is the last chance to commit all sins, all forbidden fruits. You know, that's why she says, is there alcohol in it? Is there egg in it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has been possible. forbidden till now. So this is my last chance to sin. So let me do it. Yeah, that's the point. What's the worst that can happen to me? I mean, I'm not scared. <laughs> I'm there. What are you going to push me off of a cliff? I'm not standing here. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Udmila? Very happy you joined. Uh, yeah, happy to join and happy to have read the story. Great. So uh, what did you think of it? What did you I love the flow of the story. Uh, the flow is so good that after a long time, I mean, for me, after a long time, it was very satisfying to read something that flowed so smoothly. Uh, and and the fact that there were so many details, but you never felt they were details because they just went together. Uh, the entangled entanglement of the granddaughter with uh, with, with the great grandmother uh, mm -hmm. is particularly interesting because she is studying to be a doctor, and uh, I'll just say grandmother is uh, really ill. So while she's watching her grandmother, because she's learning about bodies, she, and, and this is something that your imagination does to you, that she must be also imagining what is happening to her. Because she's also discovering things as a doctor, who is to be a doctor, learning things, et cetera, et cetera. So that combination of things, of seeing someone you are really close to and love, and you know physically what is happening or you're guessing what is physically happening to her. I think that that connection was uh, pretty interesting. And uh, of course, the love between them that is enough for her to feel afraid, even though she describes all the smells, etc. that she's afraid to, to be alone in that bed or in that room when the grandmother is not around. All these details, but basically I feel she has done, the writer has done a fantastic job in putting together something we all of us know. Exactly. And yet making it so personal that it feels like a story of a particular grandmother. I mean, it's only when you're analyzing, you say, yes, I've seen this, you know, their grandmothers right. like that, etc. But when you're reading it, you feel this is an individual story of that granddaughter and that grandmother. So I think yep. that achievement was uh, pretty yep. good. I love how she loves her grandmother and she's willing to do this smuggling of snacks and all that. But then I also love how quickly Gita even goes to where she's impatient. Her mother's like, is there egg in this? Yeah, yeah, there's egg in it. There's lots of egg. Just eat it. You know, she's like, she's... She's happy to do it, but she quickly, she's not that, that traditional, whatever, I don't know what to call it, that whole, you know, uh, infinite 
amounts of patience where she'll just nod her head. Ah, there is no, and she's like, she's giving, she's telling the grandmother exactly what she wants. There's lots in it. There's not not just eggs. There's lots of it. Just just eat it. You know, you know. Fine, you've got this kink or whatever. Just do it and get it over. I want to go to bed. I I I like the the realism of that. I think. Yeah. I think everyone's spoken. So, anybody else have anything to say about the story? I mean, apart from whatever personal memories it triggers, which happens to all of us on some level or the other, but more in terms of uh, the craft of writing, the choices she made. I think only only the narrator has a name, right? The grandmother, the parents don't have a name. The doctor doesn't have a name. It's only Ratna who has a name, and uh, I think that works fine. One thing Urmila said, which I like, is that it does have a lot of detail, but it doesn't feel like it's crammed into, you know, like a, like as though it's an output of some kind of a creative writing workshop exercise. It feels like she is, the details that are relevant to Ratna, the narrator, the writer have come through and in order to kind of flesh out the characters. Even the doctor, when he comes out and the father says, you know, in the doc, he, he, she, she, she has a line about how the doctor feels sorry for the father, which I like. You know, the, doc, the father is guilty that maybe he, they didn't take her. But the doctor is like, it's okay, I understand. It, 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 it's, it, so much is done with single lines in many places in this book. And there is this, in that sentence, there is this usage of comma. That, uh, that could have been, that sentence could have been without the comma. But the comma gives the pause, and uh, I'm just opening it. We have time, so we can go through it. The neck, the doctor said, more gently. I could yes. see he pitied my father. Yeah, it's beautiful. I, it's just. It could have been written, the doctor said more gently, or the doctor said gently, but the doctor said yeah. comma more gently. And this is the funniest line. This is the line I laughed most when he said, my dad keeps a big jar of antacids off his desk. I'm like, oh, God. I'm like, oh seriously. It is such a sad line because I know so many people who had that. You know? they, they come to office, they'll have pepto <laughs> The line I love the most is is obvious to everyone. Like she could fart exactly like a train whistling its way out of the station. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of... I lost my shit at that. Yeah. <laughs> but I love the antacid. That's so clever. Yeah. A very good story. She also character uh, give character to the doctor, right? The yeah, very... gently line, and mm. he came out of the room, his face puzzled and angry. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible use of adjectives and, you know, economy of words to this. The story is only five pages or something like that. And Im immediately he is, uh, realizes that this father is a weak person. So his tone, yeah, and his tone changes. That, you know, that it's a kind of okay. And what I like about the story, of course, which has been mentioned before, one, the lust for life that the grandmother shows. Yeah. It's total lust for life. There is nothing to do with anything else. And uh, the second, when she laughs, she's laughing because she's 90 or 93 and she's lived for so long and she's laughing at life. She's laughing at life because she has seen everything. And therefore, it is, it is for her, it is laughable. That, yeah. to be able to come to that point in your life, that you laugh at life, I think that is incredible. Yeah, that, that is, I think a few people said this, that she is a survivor. And there's so many ways you approach life, right? And the way you approach it guides everything. So she's not, you know, just lying down. And there are many people who lost their husbands at, 30 or 40 and have been widowed for 50 years, 60 years, if kind of, because of the family setting, they become tremendously sheltered and, you know, kind of withdrawn. But they also have inner life. So they also have, in the end, the story is only covering a few months or whatever. But you think about, this could be an old grandmother, you, you see now as, as us, we're busy chasing 
the rupee or the dollar or whatever it is going with our lives. We, we barely notice these people in the corner sometimes, right? Like we, when we go to someone's house to visit and they have a really old person in a room, a lot of times, unless we know them, we won't even go say hi. We'll just say, oh, how, oh that's, and we talk to the people of our age and people we came to meet. They're kind of, not even in the corner, they're, they're really peripheral. I mean, I, I, I'm as guilty as anybody. You go to house and come, and did you see their grandmother? My dad would say, I didn't even know there was someone there. They're not like in the spectrum, but that person, all, even those 10 days or those 20 days a month, that is, it, it can show you so much of the life they live. And as a writer, greedily, selfishly, you can get something out of that. You can write a story. And, uh, you know, if you, if you look in the right places, I think that's one of the great things as a writer that I get from this story. You, know? you don't have to lie. You don't have to fabricate. You really don't. But you have to notice. I think we all have to notice. And then you have to kind of sift through what you want to take away from what you notice. And for I like the, the relationship, talk. you know. Oh, sorry. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I like the relationship between uh, grandmother and uh, granddaughter. It's almost as if they are co-conspirators, you know. I mean, like, there's so much love between them. Grandmother can say whatever she wants. and the, uh, grand I mean, it's like they are almost like equals. Like, you know, when you said that uh, even when she's smuggling food into her, she's not doing it with a lot of, you know, what do you call it, uh, kowtowing to the old lady or giving her a lot of respect and all. It's like, it almost like they are two little girls who are enjoying themselves, you know. I like that part of it. But they, that, also, that uh, is also... Very, very close. Yeah, that is specific mm. to the story and it's also very uh, generic in terms of, it happened in my house. I, I was mm. the youngest and I was a teenager. I was very young, 10, 11. And my grandmother and I had to share, we shared a room. My sisters had their own room and my parents had their own room. I was always with my grandmother, which meant I could get, I, I mean, it, what it meant was anybody who came to our house to visit my grandmother, they'd spend time with me. But it, it, we had a, our own dynamic of sorts in a way, you know. And grandparents are very forgiving towards grandchildren. They would, like, they're 10 times as forgiving to grandchildren as they are, as they are to their children. And it's, it's the reverse too, yeah. And I think it's very, yeah, I've, I need to think more about the... The impact of her being a great grandmother. I think the what what it what it removes her from in terms of responsibility to the to the parents of Ratna, not to Ratna. I think the relationship of Ratna with her grandparents would have been the same as as it is with her great grandmother. But for for the parents of Ratna, I think it's a huge it's it is full duty, right? His father, his parents are dead. I don't know what her parents are not mentioned, but so he's taking care of a generation above that. So that makes it very interesting. I mean, what did you guys think of the title? What was the title? It was called Remains of the Feast, right? Oh, I want to ask Chaitali, what did you think of the title? I don't know. Earlier, I thought The Art of Dying was the title. Oh, no, that's the whole book. And the whole book is okay. in some way or the other, every story has something about dying. Not every story. Yeah, that's about okay. Okay. Afternoon, everybody. I'm late, but uh, the means of the feast. For it. Hi, Rohit. Um, Hi, so. just I think it fits late. the story, right? Really, uh, yeah. it, in a way, that all that meal she was having and it was a sort of a feast. So, yeah, in that, that sense, all, I think it's appropriate. It. Yeah, that's one way of looking at it. Or the whole life is life is the feast, and that's what is the remains of the feast is that she's yeah. indulging in these things that were not available to her or forbidden to her all that time. She herself was forbidden. So. At one point, I was thinking maybe she's kind of gone senile, right? Or would that take away from the story? She's At fully the end, aware of the what she's doing chicken, and chicken she's mutton thing, right? Yeah, when she says chicken and goats or whatever, then I'm like, maybe she's senility or but then i don't want to, but i don't want her to be senile at the beginning of the story when she's asking for these things so then that becomes a little too pat in terms of it it detracts from her willingly asking for those things so i i like to think that she was completely in control of her faculty when she first asked for the cakes for the eggs she was like this is it okay goiter cancer doctor is not telling you what's happening so let me have some fun here so yeah also this wouldn't have been possible if it was a grandmother because uh, as a mother, one controls their children, right? You told your children, don't eat meat, don't eat eggs, you're not allowed to do this. You've yelled at them, you've shouted at them, maybe you've hit them. 
So in front of your child, you cannot uh, demand for these things because you didn't allow your child to do those things. But in front of your great granddaughter, this man, you know, even to your- No, I, I think even if it was a that part would work, but what wouldn't work is that if you had been a grandmother, then Ratna's parents would have been far more controlling of her. They would not have let her be. That's the, the reverse relationship would not have been that strong, which is why- no, but I think that. even if it's not one generation removed, uh, even if it had been her own kids, I think there's still that sense of this duty. Yeah, so yeah, uh, I there. don't think it would have been too much of an issue for the story if it had been just the grandmother. Really? Because I mean, if the grandmother is 90, it's at a point ki, uh, even as uh, kids who are responsible for our elders, you have to give up at some point and be practical. Yeah. Exactly. So, at least I've seen that because my grandmother was uh, again 90, in her 90s and uh, this scenario seemed very familiar. So even though it's one generation removed, I think even if it had been uh, the grandmother's like daughter-in-law, I could see her behaving that way. It's more because before yeah, she her, got into her 90s, she was also a very pious thing, woman, yeah. bound by ethics and okay, yeah. we are vegetarian, we will not eat this yeah, and not that yeah. and she cannot wear a red sari. So... Yeah. Well, that's just, that's because that's her daughter's first silk, yeah. I mean, even I know enough that... No, not even a first silk because I think there's a, not just that because uh, it's widow's weights, right? So she cannot wear a red sari. So it's there's more layers there than just the uh, uh, being an expensive silk. So what else? What's the other one? What is it's what, what, what are the other layers? It was death. No, because oh. she was a widow, right? So widow. you cannot okay. uh, wear a full red sari. Yeah, that the brown, no light brown chaitali. It's mentioned. Yeah, that light yeah. brown saris or gray saris and the shaved head. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's a particular the ritual, yeah. yeah that's, it's the same uniform, right? Yeah. yeah, so you cannot go against those protocols. So uh, it isn't even just that it's her first daughter, Silk, or it isn't just about money there. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, who feels like doing some writing? Yeah, just one last point about yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, the title. The remains of the oh, yeah, feast. Uh, maybe this is a bit too imaginative, but for me, the remains of the feast is the title for the grand great granddaughter, because she has seen this feast of her grandmother's life, and what that feast has been and what it will remain for her as remembrance of her great grandmother, and in that feast, what remains, you know. The fact that I thought it was very interesting what Alka pointed out about the smell of the dead roses. And she says dead roses. She doesn't say fresh roses. That pressed, pressed, yeah. Yeah, pressed dead roses is also, also sometimes, and this again is maybe, uh, maybe not intended. When a person passes away, uh, sometimes people do say, not always, very, very rarely, say that they can smell a particular flower or a particular scent, which is there. Uh, for them, it becomes an indicative of their presence. So obviously for her, definitely it is her grandmother. That's it. But I thought her use of the title was great. One doesn't come back to it. Uh, I'm glad Sumit pointed out. No, that's a good point. It's a good title because it kind of, it's not direct, but it's it, it's a glancing title which makes you think about it, which I like. Sort of talking to. Oh, Rohit, were you able to read the whole story? I know you joined a bit late, right? You're on mute. We can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Good afternoon. Um, no, I'm not um, read that much, but uh, after listening you all, it's a bit a uh, very interesting story. After all, hello, I'm audible. Yeah, yeah. Did you did, were you did you join the session early enough to listen to me read the story or not? I'm just not clear. 
No, no, no. I am okay. not. Okay, and you I had mean, not read it. Be- you yeah. had not read it before coming to the session, right? Yeah, I am unable to do that. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So, all right. Well, thanks for joining anyway. But yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. It's a pleasure. Always. All right. Um. Does anyone have anything more they want to add on the story? Any thoughts? Um. How anything they might have done differently? If something that didn't work. Any Chatali said that she would have ended it one paragraph earlier, which I kind of understand what she's saying. But um, I think that paragraph has more emotional heft than the last paragraph. Although I like the last paragraph for its own reasons. But, um, it is just that if, uh, I had written the story, if I had written the story, assuming I wrote the rest of it as good, I would have probably left out the whole part about the doc, the, the, the granddaughter studying medicine because that. I don't. I don't think it's too much on the nose, but I would. May, I maybe I would not have been cared you know, to put that in there. And to me, the story still works to a large degree without that. Maybe all of it. So I, I don't think it's essential that way. But like Urmila said, that also serves its own purpose. Apart from that, I don't know. I am hard pressed to find too much that I would want to tinker with in this story. I'm. I'm. It's a. It's a really. It, it's it marvelous economy. Just five and a half pages or whatever, and. Just that this observation, which which uh, may, I mean, almost everyone has noticed that uh, that uh, uh, in front of death, uh, before the final ending, a person is not going toward God, not going toward love, not going toward relationship, but toward those mm-hmm. inner desires, which is mostly related with health, with food. And uh, and later, of course, at the end, uh, of course, dressing well, which is which is which is not in popular uh, the popular narrative which is given to us uh, is not there, Correct. but it is it is the truth. It is the truth. You you go you go after your appetites basically, right? Yes. I think that's what you done. I mean, if if I, if I could have just if I could have written a story only on the basis of that insight. I would have been very proud. Yeah. You and me both. Yeah. It's not, it's not the food, the food dominates her last mm-hmm. desire. Basically, it is representing her, her rebellion against all the traditions and uh, whatever conventions she's been following. That's why that Christian, he's a Christian, he's got a Muslim boy working. Etc. Etc. Or even that red sari, I want that. This basically a rebellion against whatever the societal pressure. It doesn't leave us conformity. Even... Yeah, just a, a lashing out against conformity, which conformity. she was respectable. I, 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 I probably would like to doubt a little bit. Yes, at About... the level is a rebellion probably, but there is something else in a very subconscious level. I mean, yeah. because I, I have seen, I, I, I have seen this with men, women, both. And they were very kind uh, people, and they were very, uh, you know, very responsible people. And when they were just you know, losing themselves before death, and suddenly this great attraction toward food, you know, especially the foods uh, they 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 used to like from their childhood. Those foods, you know, they will not share with anybody. This is so strange to look at, and uh, you know, it, it is something which is beyond this it means. They have crossed this boundary, and this boundary is not social, societal boundary. This boundary is somewhere here, a neurological yeah, boundary. Possible. Yeah, neurological boundary where they have gone to accomplish selfishness, you know, which is which is very fascinating to observe. I, mean, I have observed it, it, it a few is, times. It's here. a selfishness that I think they've kind of tapped out, holding back. They, they, you know, I've I've controlled this long enough. It, it's the same. Another way this manifests is that people who are diagnosed with a terminal disease or a close, they become very brutally honest. So they don't care. You know, they, what are you going to do to me now? You know, they, they get, I've seen older people who can be like really stinging tongues and people who are, they, they, they just say it and they say things that other people are afraid to say or they say things that just exactly the same thing. Like, this is, how, I only have this much left. I'm not going to waste it in niceties or whatever. So that's definitely there. Oh, thanks, sir. Also, uh, realize, realizes the futility of uh, these things, you know, 
that what did i achieve by not eating eggs or by not uh, taking uh, consuming alcohol or whatever everything is meaningless now you know so it's, it's might as well try might as well <laughs> might as well uh, do everything that you know in, in this one life that i so Yeah, that's the problem. If you do it all for the wrong reasons, like you do it for other people telling you to do it, then at some point, if you wake up, that's got to be the most horrible feeling in the world. Right? You realize that you're kind of. I think one of the reasons why people do turn to food as they're just nearing towards the end is also because food and sex are two primal pulls mm-hmm. of life, and <laughs> sex is gone anyway. so the one primal need and the pi- primal pull of life is food and that okay. that is what pulls it to them because then I'm everything the- else is falling off anyway exactly yeah, that's the yeah, yeah sex and food those are the two basic appetites so yeah the carnal desires but what you know urmila you made me think about this that in this whole story uh, this is not given when the great grand when did the great grandfather die Her husband. Hmm. She said so when she was thirty. She she mentions it. He was in the hospital for two months and then he died. But how old was he or was she when he died? She she she, had, she was in her thirties when she last met her met the doctor. Yeah. Which was during her husband's treatment. At least that's what I got. No, 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 no. I don't not think so. Not doing that. Because her son is scared of the sight of blood, not her husband. Oh, son is scared of because Umila said. She says your grandfather was in the hospital for three months. That is not her husband. That's her son. Hmm. Yeah. But that was when she was thirty, no? No, last time I saw a doctor, she doesn't say when her husband died. She says the last time I saw a doctor, I was thirty. So. She may well have her husband may have died young. That maybe that maybe that's why she only had one child. But she says. No, but yeah. she says but she though says, she lived long, the great granddaughter says though she lived long. So he had only had one child. Huh? See, so, yeah. so then the great grandfather may also have lived long, but he is not mentioned. He is no. not relevant to the story. That's all right. No, no, he is not. Just now, Urmila said that sex and uh, food. Yeah. I said even that she maybe she was deprived of if her husband died early. So maybe, but then that then that though yeah. she lived long, not had a kid, would not have come in. Right? All right. I think we should move on to uh, something we've started the last few months. Can we'll we take a picture? Yes, we'll take a picture and then we'll do the writing exercise. Snehal, Swati, Utmila, Chaitali, Boka, whatever your name is. Uh, can you? <laughs> <Thank I'm> <laughs> I'm a, I'm I'm afraid to see what Advait's hair is going to look like today. Advait, camera on. Boka Haram, come on. Is he there? Yes. Is with his Boka probably. Yeah, just yeah. Take the picture. Okay, Photoshop him in later when he wakes up or whatever. All right. Um. I didn't know which exercise to give. I came up with two exercises. Came up means uh, that's code for found on the internet. So we can decide. Well, I'll go through both the exercises and we can choose one of them. Okay, let me just copy. Okay, this first exercise. The point is, uh, when you're writing a book, you want to write about uh, what's going on behind the characters in your own book. Okay. So what this exercise does is make you pay attention to what's going on behind your back in your own fiction. Another thing we learn is how to let your characters interact with each other's words, implicitly summarizing or paraphrasing. You want the reader to be able to find out what's being said without hearing it. So I um, mean, I'll just show you the exercise, okay? So your protagonist, assuming you're the protagonist, you can you can do it in first person or third person. That's fine. You're you're writing a fairly long telephone conversation maybe you can make it shorter for this exercise overheard by someone about two people they, they, obviously there are two people on the phone and the third person is listening so you can only hear one person okay and you know both people and they have some relationship they can be friends they can be lovers they can be husband wife they can be partners they can be grand great grandmother and granddaughter that, that's also fine 
but you only hear one side of the conversation. Okay. Obviously, you can't make it into a bland, generic, hi, how are you, how are you, that kind of stuff. You have to kind of involve, include, create some kind of conflict in, this, in, in that discussion. Maybe they have a disagreement or maybe they have, you know, something that maybe, maybe they have some undercurrent of tension between them. That is up to you. But by reading this side, I should be able, the reader should be able to get what the other person would have said and what is going on there. And you don't want to be, you don't want it to be too expository, like the person on this side saying, don't you remember, we went there, we stole this, and you're now you're hiding. You, obviously, you don't want that, because that would be cheating. Okay. Is, is this clear? I think it's pretty straightforward. Okay, this is one. The other one is a, a little variant on this, is that you happen to run into two people at a public place, say a restaurant, a coffee shop, or a mall, not a cinema where you can't talk about and they just create a conversation between the three of you where there's some serious tension between the two of them. And they can be friends or a couple or related. Again, anything goes. And they both talk to you, but not to each other. So try to see if you can have distinctive voices for all three. And they both kind of, when they talk to you, they will hint at the cause of the, the disturbance in that relationship or the tension but you're not fully aware and it can't be done explicitly. So it has to be implicit. So one of these two, whichever you want. Um, so wait, the second exercise is the third person has to guess what the, uh, what the other two characters are having the tension about. So it's not a riddle. You don't guess, but what you do is you write it in such a way that third person can to some level deduce it, but you don't want to give a ah, bunch okay. of like a detective mystery and all that, but you want to how will two people <clears throat> imagine you are you're having a fight with your girlfriend and I come and you're talking to me and I know also both of you right. are pissed off talking to me about something else or maybe about me, whatever that that is up to you. Okay. You talk that you're not you don't talk to each other, you talk at each other, but to me. So I kind of pick up on that. Okay. And how I respond is that is also up to you. That you as you you can be as involved or uninvolved as you want. You can instigate them, you can kind of be a peacemaker, that's up to you. If you, can, right. if you can read right, so, the first para once again, maybe yeah, yeah, hear this. yes to what what is being what we are being told. This yeah. one? Purpose. The purpose. What you, this exercise purpose. will make you pay attention to what's going on behind your back, in a sense, in your own picture. Another thing you may learn from this exercise is how to let your characters interact with each other's words, implicitly summarizing or paraphrasing. You want your reader to be able to figure out what's being said on the other end of the line that we can't hear. Conversation often does this a little maddeningly. Dialogue is interesting repetition. So you can get a lot of, you can, you can communicate a lot through repetition. By, just by the way someone says something two or three times, you want me to go and do this. You want me to go and do this. You want me to go, you know, you, by saying that over and over, if you different emphasis, you can see that I'm getting more and more pissed off at you. So that kind of thing. So that's this exercise. I, I think one thing I did, I mean, I worked on this a little bit today. These exercises, you may not finish them. It, it won't be the finished product by the end, but I think both of them are exercises that you can definitely utilize in whatever you're writing in terms of you kind of uh, come Shambu, up with a rough form today uh, and then go on. Can you post these on the chat? Can you post these on the chat? Yeah, yeah, sure. All right, so it's 4.43, we'll come back in 15 minutes. And we could write either of them. 81, yeah. And the word count is just a suggestion. You're obviously welcome to write more or less. It's just... Do you want me to keep this window open? Yes. No uh, yes. I don't want to show both exercises though, side by side. No, they are both there in the chat. Yeah, they're both in the chat, so that's fine. You don't right. need to see this. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. So we we'll start. Yeah. You got from it what I got. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shankar. Thank you. 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 Thank she was nice. in a dark room throughout the session. Now she's turned on the light in the house. Oh, she's moved to another place. Who? Oh, no. Alka, okay. Okay. Uh, oh, no.
Absolutely. Absolutely.